Welcome to the podcast, Amazing Tales from Off and On Connecticut's Beaten Path, and I'm your host, Mike Allen. Well, today we're going to look at a very special place in Connecticut. Actually, more than a place, it's really kind of a concept. It's a place really so special that our guest today thinks we ought to take steps to preserve it once and for all for future generations. We're talking about the Old Connecticut Path, and it is the path that the first European settlers took when they founded Connecticut. Our guest is Jason Newton. He's a retired educator from Massachusetts. He's tirelessly studied the path while looking to chronicle his family's ancestral history. We found the path, he hiked it, and maybe more to the point, he experienced it. And he's going to share all those thoughts with us in just a moment. This week's trivia question. What's very old, very valuable, probably shiny, and is reportedly still stashed away around Connecticut? Well, stick around after the main program for the answer because you'll then know the topic for next week's show. Amazing Tales from Off and On Connecticut's Beaten Path is brought to you by our sponsor, Yale New Haven Health. Yale New Haven Hospital was the very first hospital in Connecticut. They opened their doors 200 years ago and later introduced the entire country to the use of penicillin and chemotherapy. Today, some of the brightest minds in medicine choose to work there, and it's the primary teaching hospital for the prestigious Yale School of Medicine. For more information, log on to ynhhs.org. That's ynhhs.org. Today, we're going to delve into a story about something truly historic inside Connecticut. In fact, most of the topics we talk about on this podcast don't have nearly the historic importance that today's topic does. Now, at first blush, you might kind of shrug your shoulders and say, what's so special about a trail? After all, we've got hundreds of hiking trails in Connecticut, good ones, too, that take us to spectacular places with views and experiences that stick with us for a long time. So what is so special about this old Connecticut path? Well, in many ways, the old Connecticut path is really kind of symbolic. It marks a time when European settlers and Native Americans who were already here truly started to interact with one another in the new world. And it highlights the way that that path literally facilitated the interaction. And we're going to come back to all this in just a minute. There's something else, for now at least, that's very special about this trail, and that's the fact that it's still available, most of it, in its natural state. But we cannot guarantee that forever. It provides really an unspoiled look back into our past, An opportunity like this really has very few parallels in Connecticut. Well, let's head back to the start of this story, and that start belongs squarely to the Native Americans. They lived in this beautiful, bountiful area that we call the Forgotten Corner of Northeast Connecticut, and of course they had a special relationship with the land and with nature in general. They they understood nature's secrets and many of its tricks. They had overcome the obstacles that we find when we go into nature, and they knew how to survive off the land and, frankly, live in harmony with it. There was a respect for the land and all that it had to offer. Well, when traveling from the woods and the hills to the rivers and the streams that were all over Connecticut, Native Americans knew the best routes. Long before we had maps, GPS, compasses, they instinctively followed the arc of the sun to know, for example, which direction they were headed They knew the seasons, the challenges and benefits that all four of them brought to Connecticut. They had learned many agricultural tricks, and not the least of which was that they caught many tiny fish in Long Island Sound and then stuck them into the base of the cornstalks in the dirt underneath them to act as a natural fertilizer. So it was that when the first winter came, when the Europeans had arrived from England and set up their colony near Boston, that the Native Americans were able to help. And it says a lot about the fact that they did help, particularly now looking back in retrospect, what happened to them over the years since that time. Well, the first winter was especially cold and bitter, and the settlers were in danger, frankly, of not making it. Well, that's the first time that the old Connecticut path came into play, bringing the settlers and Native Americans together. The path, you see, stretched from the fertile lands of the Connecticut River Valley all the way to the Boston Harbor. And the Native Americans, well, they had stored excess corn by the river where they had planted it. And that first winter, they carried it on their backs to the starving settlers near Boston, allowing them to survive. Well, the second instance where the old Connecticut path came into play was in the year 1636, 
Now, that year, a disgruntled 50-year-old minister in the Massachusetts Bay Colony decided to leave the colony with a large number of his followers and some cows and head into the woods in search of a new land where their brand of religion could be followed. Well, this expedition, led by a gentleman named Thomas Hooker, used the old Connecticut path to make their way the 100 miles from modern-day Cambridge, Massachusetts, to Hartford. And they would create the first colony in Connecticut in land inhabited for centuries by Native Americans. Now, in recent years, many Connecticut residents have learned of the existence of the historic old Connecticut path from a somewhat unlikely source. And it's a retired educator from Holden, Massachusetts, named Jason Newton. He's our guest today. Jason is a remarkable man. He's an educator by trade. He moved from being a school psychologist to a special ed director, and in his last position, he was a school administrator. Now, I'm not going to spoil this story by telling it here. He'll be along shortly to do that himself. But what I can tell you is that he has selflessly shared his findings about this trail with the world on the Internet. We're talking about the findings he's compiled over a number of years of research, hiking in the woods, reading maps, some of them ancient, and applying his knowledge about the outdoors. So a man from Massachusetts has given Connecticut residents more information about the trail that was used to form their own state than almost anybody else. Yes, the individual towns along the way have a lot of great knowledge stored up in their local historical societies and libraries, but it was Jason who really kind of put it all together for the first time since 1989, back when the Connecticut Historic Commission studied the matter, but good luck trying to find that report online. And so with all of that as background, we delve into today's discussion about the old Connecticut path with Jason Newton. Jason, let's start off with what is really most important, I think, probably to you, and it would be to me as well, which is family. And you retired from your job as an educator and wanted to learn more about your family. And if you're anything like me, it got into rabbit hole status and you went further and further and investigated and investigated and found some unbelievably interesting stuff that led you to mapping out, at least putting together the remnants of the old Connecticut path. Just tell us his story. How did all this happen? Well, Mike, it goes back to my immigrant ancestor, Reverend Roger Newton. 1638, he came over to Massachusetts and was one of the first students to enroll in Harvard. And in 1640, our family story is he ran off to Connecticut and married a hooker, Mary Hooker, daughter of Reverend Thomas Hooker. And I also found a connection with groups that went down at the same time from Dorchester to Windsor in Connecticut and Watertown, who went on down to Wethersfield and later to Milford, Connecticut. So I found out of one ancestor, my ancestor, Roger Newton, all these connections back to early Connecticut. The mystery was how they got there. Now, when you talk about the old Connecticut path, and I... I've done some episodes on what we used to, what we call the upper post road, the middle post road, and the lower post road, which are the three sort of original ways of getting mail from New York City through Connecticut up to Boston. And it turns out that as all of these ancient roads and uh, and, and transportation routes, they were started by Native Americans. And what intrigues me about what you are working on with this old Connecticut path. If I understand it right, this was really, for settlers coming from Europe and landing in Massachusetts, this was the first trail that took them westward out of their settlements and really began this movement throughout what would become the United States. Yeah, that's part of the allure here. And the mystery of it was that there's so little that is historically recorded other than Governor Winthrop noted in his journals that, you know, May 30, 1636, the Hooker congregation left for Connecticut, about 100 people and 160 cows, but there was no clear trail, so he had to do a little digging to go back. Unfortunately, they didn't have GPS to leave little breadcrumbs for us to find, but the native trails, there was no one super highway. There were multiple ways to get from one place to another. They generally had summer trails down in the valleys and winter trails that ran across the highlands. 
the roads that were later developed, you bring up the middle post road and the upper post road, likely were early native trails, but they were the best ones to adapt for wheeled transit. The trails that I was looking for were up in the highlands that had been bypassed. Remnants of the trails that I found up in the highlands are a wonder for us to discover up there in Northeast Connecticut. The native people who had been here thousands of years knew the best ways to travel across this wilderness land. The native people actually traveled, and you can follow it today along a string of ponds. And you can follow these chains of ponds, and the Highland Trails offered places for them to stop, much like today at a truck stop. You could get whatever you needed right at one of these stops along the way. So the Native Pond Trail gives us an alternative to the routes that have been paved over and give us more of the experience of what it might have been like in those times traveling through the wilderness. Now, I do a little bit of this, and I would call it amateur sleuthing of going out and trying to find old paths and whatnot, but I, I'm interested to hear your take. So now, you're retired as an educator. You're finding this information. You walk out into the woods where you think these paths might be, and what did you do? What did you see? What did you find? First of all, I got lost, and it's good to get lost because then you have a chance to get found, and I found through this a path that's most reasonable to walk through the woods where there were old roads and old trails, and surprisingly, there were modern trails that the Connecticut Forest and Park Association has developed that are wonderful in providing access to the woodland that give you the experience that might be like what it was walking through the Connecticut woodland on that migration. Now, I'm assuming that these highland routes that you went were not the ones that, say, in the 1700s were used for stagecoaches. No. One of the things that, you know, you have to appreciate, and as a hiker, you would appreciate that if you travel down in the valleys and you look and imagine a landscape without bridges, how difficult it'd be traveling down in the valleys when you get to the rivers, because the rivers down in the valley collect all the water from up on the hills. So there'd be times of the year where it'd be impossible to travel. So what I found and the native people found that at those times, it's better to travel up in the highlands because you can step across the brooks. Uh, you didn't have that obstacle. It was a reasonably safe way to travel. Now, what have you learned about how the Native Americans survived during these times? Like you said, they went pond to pond, so they obviously had their water source and they certainly had wildlife throughout there that they could trap and, and eat. Anything else that you learned about Native American ways in doing your research? The Native people had lived well in the land that they settled on in the Connecticut Valley and in the upper northeast corner of Connecticut. It was a rich area for them to live with corn, other things that they could raise. There are artifacts that show that they were here for thousands of years. This was an important corridor or place for their travel when you'd see artifacts that would be seashells that would show up on a pond in the middle of the Northeast Connecticut. Now, similarly, I assume you found some records from, say, the Hooker expedition heading from Massachusetts to Connecticut, and it really didn't take them, all, all things considered, that long to make that trek. Well, the only clue that we have is from uh, Governor Winthrop again. He said it took him about a fortnight, so you figure about 10 days. It's just about 100 miles. As a hiker, you know, a 10-mile hike a day is pretty good. And if you're walking on a rougher trail or you're driving cattle, 10 miles is a pretty good estimate. We have to imagine that these were people coming from England that were middle class, had anywhere from three to five years to get settled in the area of Cambridge and Dorchester in the Austin area, and then uprooted again to walk through the wilderness. And they were used to walking, but this was into a wilderness that they couldn't have imagined. There were no hotels to stop at. They had to stop and sleep on the ground. They did not have wagons, at least in that first journey, because they were on trails. So you can imagine the hardships that were there in them traveling this route through this wilderness. 
And that's, I think, going back to why I was so intrigued with walking these trails and discovering them, is that there's a connection when you're walking in the quiet of a wilderness that you have the feeling of following in their steps. So they leave Massachusetts, they come to Connecticut, and if I have my history right, and I'm relying on you to correct me on this, the first settlement, per se, in Connecticut was in Windsor. Is that correct? That was the earliest in that part of the valley. There's some competition between Windsor and Wethersfield to which was settled first, and it's kind of an arguing match. But it's a point of you know rivalry between those towns. But within that frame of time between 1633 and 1636, there was much settlement going on. And then following that, there were many more folks who came down to Connecticut. So the Hooker expedition to which you can directly tie your ancestral lineage, where was that wedding? Do you know what town that even occurred in? My ancestor, Roger Newton, went down to study and prepare for the ministry in the home of Thomas Hooker. And he lived in the home for four years. And during that time, uh, he obviously became close to Mary Hooker. And they were married in the Hooker home in 1644 in Hartford. Much went on in that early period. Mary Hooker, as a 12-year-old, walking from Cambridge to Connecticut, 16-year-old woman having Roger Newton come in to live with the family and then marry four years later. Jason, here you are, a Massachusetts resident. Did this in retirement, started off as a family you know, lineage project, got to the point of where it is, and at some point, as you said to me before we started recording, you're not a Connecticut resident. This is not your responsibility to make Connecticut sit up and do something about preserving the old Connecticut trail. But if you had a magic wand and could make things sort of begin and go into place and happen, what would be the next steps in terms of taking all of this work and all this information and doing something with it? I'm going to suggest that here we are 390 years out from the anniversary of the settlement of the Connecticut colony. That means in the next 10 years, folks in Connecticut might want to do something to celebrate a portion of their heritage in the 400th anniversary. One of the ways that that could be honored would be forming a Connecticut Heritage Greenway that connects many of the wondrous places that I was fortunate to discover that give you that sense of experiencing the land as those pioneers may have experienced it, and also connects importantly to the heritage of the native people who lived in these lands for thousands of years before the arrival of those first settlers. For the people of Connecticut to go out and explore and experience some of the places along this route so that they can appreciate what has been preserved and is there for them and for future generations to experience. That would be my wish. Connecticut has a National Heritage Corridor. It's called the Last Green Valley. We did a podcast episode on it previously. In fact, the old Connecticut path passes through the Last Green Valley. Could the state host its own heritage corridor? Well, I've had the privilege of visiting several parts of the old Connecticut path, and personally, I'd say it's worthy of preservation and protection so that this story can be told to future generations and they'll have a chance to actually walk in those same woods and experience it for themselves. As a postscript, Jason found the path on his own, cobbling together ancient maps, tidbits of history from a variety of local sources, and he then compared his findings to the most authoritative examination on the trail that had been done in state history, which was the 1989 Connecticut Historic Commission study I talked about earlier. Well, he said he was pleasantly surprised to learn that with just one really tiny exception, his findings of where the path actually went lined up with what the Connecticut Historic Commission had found independently. <laughs> 
that wraps up this episode of Amazing Tales from off and on Connecticut's Beaten Path. If you want to visit the old Connecticut path and walk around in the woods, just drop me a line at my email address and I'll get you some directions. Just write me at amazingtalesct at gmail.com. Now, if you can't wait, the path tends to meander between the land off of exits 69 and 71 of I-84 in Wyndham County. I want to thank our guest for today's program, Jason Newton, the retired educator from Massachusetts whose quest for ancient family ancestors in Connecticut led him to rediscover the old Connecticut path. The answer to this week's trivia question, what's very old, very valuable, probably shiny, and is reportedly still stashed away around Connecticut? The answer, hidden treasure left behind from the Revolutionary War. Next week on Amazing Tales CT, we're going to be joined by Joseph Iamartino, director of the Thompson Historical Society, and he's got some intriguing stories to tell about past treasures that just might be near your backyard. Amazing Tales from Off and On, Connecticut's Beaten Path is a production of True North Associates, LLC. This is Mike Allen. Be safe and please stay healthy. Stay healthy.